that would help us tremendously. All right, uh, this morning we will be in Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. We've been studying our way through the book of Daniel and been awesome to see this theme that, you know, God's kingdom is greater than any earthly kingdom. We have a lot of earthly kingdom issues in the world, as, uh, as we probably always do. Right now, it seems fairly intense. Uh, there are issues in our country, in our nation. There are issues around the world. There are lots of, lots of cause for anxiety, lots of cause for concern, lots of trouble, um, and trouble for God's people, persecution around the world. But one thing we've seen as we've looked at the life of Daniel and his companions as they have been in Babylon during the, the exile. Remember, God allowed his people to be sent into exile for their sin. But it was temporary. After 70 years, they returned back to, back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, and uh, God is faithful. But in this period, when we see Daniel and his companions living truly in Babylon, and, and Babylon becomes for us a picture of the world and the world system in Scripture, how faithful God is to his people, and how God has uh, a plan, and how God is at work, even through the pagan nations of the world. You know, God is still sovereign, and God is still in control, and that's good truth for us in the day in which we live. So we're going to continue on now in Daniel chapter 6 this morning. As we get into Jan Daniel 6, we recognize that uh, some, some significant changes have happened from earlier in the book. At, at this point in Daniel's life, he is an old man. He is at least in his mid-80s. And if you're in your mid-80s, you're not that old. But, but Daniel is an old... I was thinking of you, Harvey. Um, uh, Daniel is an old man. Uh, he has been serving God consistently since he was a young man brought to Babylon as a teenager. And uh, yet now we're even past the kingdom of Babylon. Remember we read in chapter five how Babylon was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians. And so Daniel has now been serving God, not only in Babylon, but now in the next empire. He's outlasted, he's outlasted Babylon itself. And um, uh, so, We'll see now how Daniel begins to interact and what happens with the new administration, the new Persian empire, and yet he's still serving the king and he's still serving the God of heaven. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We ask God that you would give us encouragement, that you would give us wisdom. Father, we ask that you would strengthen our faith. Lord, we live in the world. You told us we would be in the world, but not to be of the world. Yet we're here, we're in the world, and we're here, here, we are here for your purposes. And so we ask that you would strengthen us to be witnesses, to be faithful to you, to be faithful to your call. And God, we pray that you would speak out of Daniel chapter 6 to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's begin. The first section here, we're going to do three sections in this chapter. And I call it the plot. This is the plot. And it's going to be a plot against Daniel and against his life. It says, it pleased Darius, that would be the Persian king. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom. And over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdoms, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree 
that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign it the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. So as we get into chapter six, we find that some things are, have not changed. And one thing that hasn't changed is that Daniel is still faithful. He is still a faithful servant to the empire and still distinguishing himself. And, and those who are above him, the king is, is recognizing there's an excellent spirit in Daniel, as has been repeated in the previous chapters. So same old Daniel, faithful, and God is, is promoting him. God is using him. Uh, and we see just this exemplary witness of God through the life of Daniel to these pagan kings. And we hear it now even in the mouths of Daniel's enemies, those who dislike him. I mean, they say very plainly, there's no charge or fault found in him because he's faithful. And Daniel now is, his excellence is creating some animosity among his coworkers. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but it does happen, right? Sometimes people get jealous. Sometimes the light is bright. I think the indication to us in the text, though it's not explicit, I think it's hinted at, I think one of the issues is Daniel was just so faithful, um, he wouldn't let those under him get away with any of their normal corruption. You know, I mean, it says that the king set these rulers in place so that the king would suffer no loss. And Daniel was found to be excellent. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't put in a pet project, no pork barrel politics under Daniel, no kickbacks, you know, no shenanigans. Um, Daniel was just detailed and he was faithful and, and he ran things uh, under his control righteously. And, and, and that was a bright light and it really infringed upon, uh, I think, the, the appetites and the lifestyle and um, uh, the corruption for those who were under him. Things were no longer proceeding as they usually did. Daniel was upsetting the apple cart, so to speak. Now, his enemies, looking for an opportunity to take Daniel down, realize, man, we're not gonna find any fault. Like, we can't go check his books and, and see that he did anything um, inappropriate. You know, we're not gonna find any fault in his work before the king. We're going to have to do something to catch him uh, in his religion. And, and we're going to have to make his faith the thing that stumbles him because we know him and, and he's not going to deviate from that. So if we can create some division, if we can make that a problem between him and the king, then we've got something. Listen, John 3, verse 20 through 21, Jesus says this. Jesus says, everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Everyone practicing evil hates the light. When you're used to the dark and you like the dark and you're operating in the dark and then somebody comes into your room and flips the light on and you don't expect it, I don't know about you, I get upset. Like, turn, turn that thing off. You know, I'm here watching a movie. What are you doing? Turn that light off. But he who practices evil hates the light. So they attack his faith. We read that they come to the king and they, they come up with this plan. You know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna set a time when nobody can petition God or man except the king. And I imagine this probably appealed to the king because, you know, it was like reinforcing loyalty to him. It, it, was, it was very similar to when Nebuchadnezzar said, you're going to have to bow down to the, 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 the gold image that I've made. You know, it's a loyalty test. And uh, probably this appealed to the king's ego. And unthinking, not being critical, he signs this new law. But this is their trap. 
you know, there are times, there will be many times as a Christian when we find ourselves in opposition with other people. Opposition at work, opposition in the homeowners association, opposition in the community, opposition, and, and people will even do things to try to, you know, move us out of the way or thwart our plans or humiliate us. The very important thing that we need to do when we run into these kinds of conflicts is we need to start from a place of humility. You know, we need to follow Matthew 7, 4, which says, you know, before you worry about the speck in somebody else's eye, you should make sure you don't have a plank in your own eye. This is such an important biblical principle that, that we would, when we come into a place of conflict, we would stop and we would reflect and examine ourselves. Say, you know, am I in hot water right now because I jumped in the pot or because somebody put me there? You know, is this, is this a result of my own sin? Have I sinned against somebody? Have I done something unknowingly? unwittingly even, that I need to make right, you know? And if so, then we can address it and we can be humble and we can make it right and go forward and, and mend that relationship to the, uh, to the best of our ability. But sometimes it's just that people are angry and they might be responding against us because they're really responding against righteousness. They're really responding against the light uh, of Jesus that shines out of our life or our character that God is has worked in us or the work of the Holy Spirit within us. And they can respond that way. And this is the case with, with Daniel. And, um, and so when his, when his co-workers come and manipulate the king and they create this loyalty test, by the way, a little side note, this will relate later in the text. This loyalty test, this, you know, nobody can petition any God or man except the king. I just, I tell you, I get really nervous when people start to um, solicit my loyalty. You, you know, you, you should really do this for me because I've done X for you. You should really, if you were really a, a good person, if you were really a good patriot, if you were really a good employee, if you were really a good, you just fill in the blank, then, then you would get in line with this process or this program or, or what we're doing here. And I just tell you, it makes me nervous because I have a loyalty and my loyalty is to Jesus. And I believe the, the godly attitude, the biblical attitude is loyalty is something that we earn from people by loving them and serving them and being faithful to them. And loyalty, loyalty is something other people give you know, they respond to that and they give. They, you, you get to give your loyalty to a friend. You get to give your loyalty somewhere. But loyalty is not something we get to take. You know, it's not something we get to demand. And, and so it just makes me nervous when people start, you know, playing the loyalty card. And, and, and that's what's happening here with, uh, with these other rulers. And, and, and obviously they're trying to manipulate the king and, and the king is going along with it. But... Uh, let's look how Daniel responds. It says now, verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And, they went before, and when they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree, have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, this, the thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. And so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Isn't it interesting, the king's loyal to Daniel. How is it that the king is so loyal to, he realizes his mistake, he realizes he fell into the trap now he's caught in this legal logjam. 
and he's trying to figure out a, a way around it. In this kingdom, the law reigned supreme. And when a law was made, it could not be altered. It could not be changed. And so the king now is, is stuck. But isn't it interesting that, that he feels loyal to Daniel? You know how you win somebody's loyalty? You serve them. You serve them in love. You know, dads, if you want your family to love you and to honor you, then serve them. You know, bosses, you want employees that are loyal and faithful and do what's right. Serve them. Right? That, that's what Jesus said. He, he told the, the disciples, hey, listen, you know, when you lead, don't lord it over others like, like the Gentiles do. Right? But become the servant of all. And that's what, that's what engenders, um, that's what engenders loyalty, love, that connection, that faithfulness. If you're an in-law, we got any in-laws in the room? Hey, if you're an in-law and you want the other in-laws to be at peace and to get along with your family, serve them, serve them, right? Don't lay down edicts and, well, we get this Christmas and you guys can have next Christmas. No, be gracious, love them, serve them. And that will build that bond of love and that connection and that loyalty that is such a blessing. Daniel's been serving the king and now the king is loyal to him. Amazing, amazing. But here the king recognizes his mistake. He labors um, uh, to try to figure out how to reverse this thing. He, he works on it all day. Now, um, Look at verse 15, we'll pick up there. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, know, o king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. You know, the one thing that Daniel's enemies did not consider, they must have felt really good in this moment. Like we got him. We actually got him. But the one thing they didn't consider was what happens if their plan fails. You know, sin is deceptive that way. We often think about, you know, the glorious outcome that we want when we go our own way and make our own plans. We rarely think about what's going to happen if I'm found out or this thing unravels, right? They had no idea about what was to come. But in this moment, they must have rejoiced. Now, we see Daniel's response through this, and that is that when the decree comes down, we read uh, up there in 10, 11, and 12 that Daniel decided to pray anyway. Just because there was a decree from the king that would limit his, you know, say that he couldn't petition God or another man, you know, but this was his thing. He prayed every day. They knew he prayed every day. He opened his windows every day and faced Jerusalem and prayed. And he wasn't trying to make a show. This was just his life. This was his worship to the Lord. This is how he honored God. I think strictly speaking, you know, there's no law. There's nothing specific in the Old Testament law that says Daniel has to open his windows to pray, right? Perhaps we could reason out that maybe Daniel could just pray in his heart. He could just lay it down at night and pray quietly, pray silently, still seek the Lord, you know, but, but not, have to, not have to make a fuss, not have to make waves, not have to be a problem, you know, uh, in the kingdom, not, not put himself in danger. But even if there was maybe some technicality in which Daniel could alter his style or form of worship, 
Daniel knew that this was a direct challenge to his faith. To not pray publicly in the way that he always did would have been seen by others as honoring Darius or honoring the law, the, the Persian law, above the Lord. And, and there was no way that, Dar- that uh, Daniel was going to do that. It would have violated the heart of the first commandment, right? Have no other gods before me. And, and so I don't think Daniel ever thought twice about it. The next day, he just went and he opened up the windows and he faced Jerusalem and he prayed in the same manner, in the same way that he always did. He simply stayed the course. He didn't go out of his way to be rebellious. I mean, there's not a rebellious bone in Daniel's body. He's the most loyal, the most faithful servant of the king. This wasn't some prideful act of defiance. Daniel's just being faithful to stay the course and honoring God and worshiping the Lord. You can just hear the disdain in his accusers' voice, voices in verse 13. That Daniel. That Daniel. <laughs> you know? I think it's amazing that in chapter 1 of the book, Nebuchadnezzar changes Daniel's name to Belteshazzar. Gives him a Babylonian name. And then we kind of see his Babylonian name and his Hebrew name used sort of interchangeably through the next several chapters. And when we get here in chapter six, what does everybody call him? Daniel. Isn't that something? 65 years in Babylon and he never lost his identity as a Jew. More importantly, as a man of God. I just think, you know, 65 years in Vegas and you're still Amish. Like, how is that even possible? (laughs) That's like how different it is. 65 years. He's still every bit God's man. Still every bit the one who honors the Lord. It's incredible. What a testimony. Now, this whole conflict between the law of the Medes and Persians. Three times we've read this in the text so far. The law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not change. I mean, that was their whole thing. The law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not, when an edict goes out, it's, it's done and it can't be altered. This was their society. But this has now come in conflict with the law of God, with honoring the God of heaven, right? There will be times when man's law is in conflict with honoring Jesus and being loyal to Jesus. It's it's going to happen. It has happened. It does happen. It will happen. This is just a reality of being a citizen of a heavenly kingdom that sometimes there's going to be conflict in your earthly kingdom. But we have to follow the example of Daniel. We have to follow the example of Peter and John Remember, they got in trouble shortly after the, the ascension of Jesus. They're preaching in and, and the temple, and God used them to heal a man, and they get called in front of the religious authorities, and they didn't know what to do with them because they couldn't deny the miracle, but they at least threatened them and said, you know, you better not talk about Jesus anymore. No more preaching in this name. And, of course, Acts 4.19, but Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge, We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They didn't even rebuke them. They just said, look, here's the reality. You're telling us one thing. God's told us another. You know, you you let us know what you think is right, but but we got to do this. You know, this is just it. This is who I have to honor. Now, In verse 16, we read, of course, the king, his support of Daniel, that that he was heartbroken over this, and he works to to see him freed and can't do it. I think it's interesting. There are so many parallels between this event and the trial and the crucifixion and burial of Jesus. Jesus. I mean, for us, this event, this thing that happens in Daniel's life actually becomes a prophetic picture 
of what Jesus is going to go through. It's so amazing. Consider this. Both Daniel and Jesus are accused by the ruling class. In both cases, the rulers throng the one in charge, right? The Jewish leaders, don't they come and they throng and they come around Pilate and they demand Jesus be arrested and tried and, and executed? Well, they just wanted execution. They weren't worried about trials, right? Same thing, same dynamic. In both cases, the charges were false. In both cases, Daniel and Jesus are guiltless. In both cases, neither one offers a word in their own defense. Jesus was silent before his accusers. Isaiah 53 prophesies it, right? The gospels give us the detail. He opened not his mouth. And in both cases, the person in charge defended them and didn't want to go through with the execution. Darius trying to free Daniel. Jesus, bring, or excuse me, Pilate bringing Jesus out and say, okay, I whipped him. You know, he, we should let him go. You know, let me release him to you. Knowing their innocence. In both cases, they go into a hole. Daniel's gonna go into the den. Jesus goes into the tomb. In both cases, they're sealed with a stone. And in both cases, the stone is sealed with the seal of the ruler so that it's not disturbed. And in both cases, they walk out, right? Daniel said not a word. That's what sticks out to me. He was just willing. He was willing to suffer for his God. 1 Peter 4.13, Daniel's such an example of this. 1 Peter 4.13, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. It feels like a big verse, doesn't it? But rejoice, rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Daniel, very much in a prophetic sense, partook of Christ's sufferings. He suffered for righteousness. He suffered for the Lord. That when his glory, that is Jesus' glory, is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. How is it that a person willingly suffers alongside someone else? How is it that you willingly partake in the sufferings of someone else? I think parents know something about this. You know, when your kid is sick, your kid's hurt, they're up at night, they're doubled over because their stomach's in pain or, or they're coughing and they can't sleep. You know, what does mom do? What does dad do? We go sleep on the couch, you know, same room with them. Make sure they have what they need. You don't get any sleep that night and you got to go to work the next day, but, but it's not a big deal to you. Why? Because you love them. It's your kid. You love your kid. And if they're hurting, you're going to be right there with them, walking alongside to do what you can, right? Parents who get ill, spouses who battle cancer. We see this all the time, right? Where the husband or the wife or the son or the daughter, they come alongside and they serve and they partake and they sit their life, you know, to the side. And they just walk through them with that thing. Why do, you, why do we do that? Because we love them. That's what makes us willing to walk alongside, to partake, you know, of what they're going through, to try to aid and help in any way. You know, why did Jesus not open his mouth? Why was he led like a lamb to the slaughter, in the words of Isaiah? Well, because he was taking our place. He didn't defend himself. He was willingly a sacrifice for us. Why? Because that's how much he loves us. He loves us that much that he would just walk in that place and, and, take, and take that for us. 
What possibly is it that would prepare us to partake in the sufferings of Christ, to be reproached for his name, to endure whatever the world might throw at us? What compels the believers in Afghanistan or in China or in Iran or in any other place where there's strong persecution? It's because they love Jesus. It's because they love him. I think it's a very real question in the backs of the minds of many Christians. Maybe one we're not really comfortable articulating all the time, but we can see that the world around us is heating up. You know, the laws in our land seem to be closing in on us, on our freedoms of worship, on our ability to honor the Lord. What we're seeing, the, the laws just kind of in a way like in Daniel's world, we're seeing the laws creep in around us. Well, you have to honor this and you have to approve of that and you have to allow for this and, and you can't do that and you can't come together. And, and, and it's just like the box seems to be getting smaller and smaller. I think it's unreasonable to think that, that there will never be a significant conflict. Now, look, God can do anything. He could, revival could break out tomorrow in America. How awesome and wonderful would that be? And our whole culture could be shifted because people's hearts change. That's what we pray for. We preach the gospel. But how do we partake in the sufferings of Christ? How do we prepare ourselves for that? Right? I would say all we really need to do, we don't need to worry. I'd say what we really need to do is we just need to fall in love with Jesus. Just fall in love with Jesus every day. Because then when those things come, rejoice. You're partaking in the sufferings of Christ. Well, I love him. It's no big deal. I wouldn't do anything else. You can't make me be anywhere else. You know, I love my Lord. I love my Lord. That's where Daniel was. He'd spent a lifetime honoring God. And he wouldn't have done anything else that day except open those shutters and fall to his knees Look toward Jerusalem and pray. But while there is a plot and while there is a betrayal, guess what? There's a final act. So let's look at that now in verse 18 to 23. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no musicians were brought before him. Also his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? And then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Gosh, what did that sound like to the king? I bet his voice was just as clear and steady as it ever was. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. I think it's so cool that the king runs to the den, to that stone that was covering the den. He runs early in the morning, talking about parallels between Jesus and Daniel, who runs to the tomb early in the morning, Mary. Here the king runs to the tomb and guess what he finds? He finds Daniel alive. And he knows it's because God has delivered him. And Daniel gives testimony and says, God sent an angel and shut the mouths of the lions. Verse 24, and the king gave the command and they brought those men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions. Then their children and their wives and their lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, 
men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? You want to memorize any scripture, that would be a good spot. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. This is the final act. God brings about Daniel's salvation. The king runs in haste. He hears Daniel's voice. I want to point out just three things out of this section. And the first one is this. That God can and does do the impossible. God can and does do the impossible. All you have to do is read your Bible and you're overwhelmed with miraculous, spectacular things that God does on behalf of his people. He sends an angel. An angel shows up. He could have just put the lions to sleep, you know? He could have convinced them to fast or something, made them not hungry. But God just chose probably to encourage Daniel to send an angel. I bet the angel stood between Daniel and the lions. And Daniel probably got a good night's sleep. But God sent an angel. Listen, all the way through scripture, we see God doing miraculous things. He had an earthquake open a jail for Paul and Silas. He protected Daniel's friends from the fire. He stopped a river for Israel. He split a sea in half. He sent water from a rock. He sent Elijah a meal from a bird and the meal lasted him 40 days. God dropped fire and hailstones from heaven, sent hornets in front of Israel to defeat the Canaanites. Not a big deal for God to shut up a lion. Listen, we should just never limit God. We should always hold out the possibility that God can do the miraculous. He does it different ways, right? Samson, he gave him strength to fight. David, too little to fight. God just aimed the stone into Goliath's forehead. You know, God works in different ways. He's creative. But he knows how to deliver his people. He helped the spies escape from Jericho. In Elisha's day, he struck the Assyrian army blind to protect his people. He sent an angel to open the prison for Peter. Isaiah 59, 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. He hears and he has the power to act. That's the first thing. God can and does do the impossible for his people. We should pray with faith. And trust him. Secondly, God knows how to deal with the enemy. Did you catch that? That those who accused Daniel themselves, they were thrown into the lion's den, and not only them, but their families. The harsh reality is that our sin and the judgment for our sin can have a devastating effect on those around us. It's a high cost, a high price. But this is something... Daniel didn't have to do. Daniel didn't seek vengeance on his enemies. God knows how to serve justice, right? Listen, when we we come into conflict with the world system, with, with the world's laws or the world's rules or the world's expectations, listen, it's not about being angry against those who persecute us. That was never Daniel's focus. Daniel's focus was always, I'm gonna please the Lord. That was his concern. I'm going to please God. I'm going to let God take care of everything else. And you know what? The Lord does take care of everything else. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. It just means vengeance and justice and payback is above our pay grade. We are not qualified to do that. We don't do it well. We don't do it with the right heart. We don't do it justly. It's just something we give to the Lord. We trust him like, Lord, you know what's right. You do what's right. And he will. 
He'll bring about judgment. He'll bring about justice. We can just leave that in his hands. I'm not going to take time to read the whole thing, but it'd be good to go read Psalm 73 this afternoon. In Psalm 73, the psalmist is very upset because the wicked are doing well and the righteous are having a hard time. He actually says their eyes bulge, like they're so fat, they're so, they have so much to eat. There's no pain in their death, you know? He's just like, they're just getting off scot-free, God. These people who are against you, these wicked people. And then he says in the middle of the psalm, I almost, I said, I would have sinned if I would have said that out loud. He said, because I went into the house of God, I went into the temple of God, and there I remembered their end. And they're headed for hell. They're headed for God's judgment. And he's, even the psalmist is just able to rest and say, okay, Lord, it's, it's in your hands. We should be concerned about their souls more than we should be concerned about getting our justice. That's, that's in God's hands. And so God is faithful and he will be faithful. He will judge the world. He will make every wrong right. The third thing is, it's so awesome how God revealed himself to King Darius. I, I mean, if you just look at this proclamation that he writes for the kingdom. I make a decree in every dominion, verse 26. Men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He's the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Listen, through Daniel's, all Daniel did was keep honoring God. That's all he did. All he did was just keep honoring God. And this is the message that got delivered to the king. The king realized that Daniel served a living God, that God is real, that God is steadfast, that he's faithful. The king realized that God's kingdom will reign forever and his kingdom is temporary, that God's eternal. His dominion shall not end. The king saw that God is in control. He also saw the loving nature of God, that he delivers his people and rescues them. The king saw that God is powerful. He works signs and wonders. He saw that God is personal, that he delivered Daniel. I mean, you couldn't sit somebody down and give them a Bible study and teach them all that in five minutes. But as we honor the Lord, and God reveals himself to the world around us, just uses our, our simple obedience and simple faith and faithfulness. What a powerful witness to the world. You know, perhaps God allows us to come to these places of conflict because he wants to display his power and his grace to those who need him most. What a privilege. That's gotta be part of the rejoicing. Lord, what are you gonna do? Lord, how are you gonna use this? How are you gonna bring light into this world? Lord, I wanna be faithful to you that the world would see you. Here's the last thing. I want us to recognize the statement of Daniel when he says, O king, live forever. And then verse 22, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Da Daniel didn't create a big defense in his trial or when they hustled him off to the prison and to the den. But here, at the end, he makes this statement. I was found innocent before God, and O king, I have done no wrong to you. I have done no wrong to you. So remember what I talked about earlier? We talked about uh, this like, idea of loyalty and how people try to manipulate and, and cause us, well, if you were loyal, if you were, you know, and they try to use that as leverage to push us and to manipulate us. Listen, don't fall for that. Because if you honor God, you will do no wrong to men. Yeah, well, if I honor God, you know, so-and-so is going to get found out. If, if I'm honest at work, so-and-so is going to be in a bad light, you know. If I do this and friends will come to us and coworkers will come to us, say, well, you can't do that, you know, just gonna, I'm, you know, it's going to fall back on me. Listen, if you honor God, you will do no wrong to men. 
Now, it might be true that if you honor God, other people's deeds might be exposed. That's not on you. That's not on you. Okay? Don't be condemned in guilt because others have to experience the consequences of their own actions. If you honor the Lord, you will do no wrong to men. Man, there's such freedom in that. There's such grace in that. There's such comfort in that. Okay, Lord, I get to just honor you. And they might be upset about it, but Lord, I'm pleasing you. and I'm resting in that. And we can pray for them and we can pray for grace and we can go to bat for them and, and we can do all those things, but, but our job is to please the Lord. And the Lord is faithful and, and he, will, he will be, we know he's gracious to his people. He's faithful to his people. And, and we can, that's the witness. You can't have, you can't have love without truth. You know, but if you honor the Lord, you will do no wrong to men. Hmm. 